Hello and welcome back. Tonight we begin season two of the Tuesday Night Fiction podcast with chapter one of book two, Crystallize. This chapter is called Feeding Time. I'm Nicholas Austin, proud to say that tonight is also the release of book four of the Civil Land series, Cryptic Kingdom. So while you're listening, head to Amazon, get yourself a copy, and while you do, let's get started. The hold was a bustling place, one Laterra might have enjoyed under different circumstances. Unfortunately, in the month since the Keegans first captured her people, she had experienced everything but joy. When she had stepped into her new, unofficial role of leadership on the journey south, she could not have prepared herself for this. Throughout the hold, the Vahani of the Riverlands were treated as inferior, by both the Easterners and their rival clan, the Tokali alike. They were packed into small shelters with cots that were on top of each other. The lack of privacy was very difficult to endure. And the stench of her companions, who were limited in their ability to bathe effectively in these packed circumstances, was quick to spread. Yet that was not the worst of it by any means. While the natives of the southern Murrieta berated and ridiculed them, the Keegans did the same. And when they wanted to, also got physical. Latera had taken it upon herself to console several of the Vahani women who had experienced forceful advances. Each time she felt more angered and heartbroken, a feeling amplified by the fact that she had no idea what she could do to prevent the attacks. She wondered constantly if she'd be next, though she truly would have accepted it if it had meant she'd never have to see any of her Vahani live another day with such shame and lack of dignity. On a particularly dark rainy afternoon, Rather reflective of her mood, she thought, with all the bitterness inside her, she was leaving one of the most difficult discussions of them all. One of her closest friends here at the hold and a fellow nurse, Winona, had sent her an urgent message earlier. Her husband, Mika, had been beaten. Latera had rushed over the moment she received word. Though Winona and her husband, Mika, were several years older than Latera, both were in their late thirties, Latera had known Winona since she was a child. After Latera's mother's death, and far before Arcuda's murder, Winona had been kind enough to be there for her during her grief, and the two grew close in their shared occupational experiences. Somewhere along the way, though, they drifted apart. Latera always thought it was because she was unmarried. So much of their people's social structure was divided into the married and unmarried, and it simply became harder and harder to find common ground. But once they found themselves captured in the hold, they reunited both in friendship and purpose. With Latera leading her people, she depended on Winona's friendship to steady her. As for Mika, he was not the grizzled warrior many of the Vahani men tried to be. Anytime Latera visited the couple, he would gush about new discoveries in his research of the philosophies and religious history that guided their people. As Latera stepped out into the rain, she replayed the conversation. The men who attacked him tried to make a move on you first? Latera had asked Winona. Winona was shivering and her teeth chattering. That is right, she said. She and the rest of them were cold from the wet caused by the leaks in the roof of the shelter. It was difficult to find a dry place and she'd given the only one she could find to Mika. My Mika was just defending me, and at first they backed off. I thought it was because of the forcefulness of his defending me. But that is when I saw they had come. Clovis and Walter Keegan. Clovis did not take kindly to the strength Mika showed, so he... It is okay, Winnie. You are strong. He toyed with him. It was like a cat playing with a mouse, and there was nothing I could do but beg for it to stop as the others held me back. Winona said, pausing for a breath. 
Walter ended up having to pull Clovis back and thank the mother he had done so, or who knows. And you saw the X-shaped scar on his cheek. These terrors we endure here will remain with us for life. I am so sorry, Winnie. I should not even call those animals men. They are not men. Just as the councilmen were met with justice for their crimes, the Keegans will suffer even worse. Each of them, I promise you. Mika is so brave. Do you know what they would have done to me, Laterra, if he had not been there? This happened to him because of me. I knew we should have followed your order to only travel in larger groups, but, but I thought it would be okay with us too. Laterra was losing patience with her own inability to find some solution for this pain. She had brushed the damp brown hair out of her friend's face, which was turned toward the ground, and touched her forehead to Winona's, who was beginning to well up with tears. Do not dare blame yourself for any of this, do you hear me, Winona? Latera had said. Our lives are defined by how we endure. We will get out of this. I will get us out of this. As Winona began to breathe deeply, she had stepped away and looked straight into Latera's eyes. I will never understand how you became this, this force, Latera. You have become hardened for our sake and we can all see it. I just pray you will not allow this burden you bear to break you. There is already so much you have given, but you should not be the one to have to give everything. That might be where you are wrong, though I do appreciate the sentiment. For as much as I spend my time scheming, I do not even know what I can do right now. It is all I think about. Even if there was an option with only the slightest chance of success, I would take it, but, but nothing has come to mind yet. Well, do not consider the responsibility yours alone because it is not, Winona had said as she grabbed Latera's hands. Since the executions of the councilman, Clovis and Walter have not made a formal public appearance. They simply hung, beat, and executed our councilman in a public spectacle of violence and have only appeared in the shadows ever since. Today it was Mika. Winona paused, her voice cracking. But tomorrow, it will be another. There is nothing we can do right now until our people in the mountainlands come and kill those two bastards. Without those two, these men will be nothing. Of that I am certain, Latera had said, blowing into her hands for warmth once Winona released them. Tell Mika I said to keep his head up and be patient. The pain he is going through now will only make him stronger. The sliding of Latera's feet on mud snapped her from her reverie. The rain continued to come down as she jogged back to the shelter, and the streets of the hold were thick and muddied. The whole place was dark and felt so empty, with only the faintest candlelight peeking between the cracks in the door frames of the homes around her. It was as if everyone was hiding from what was becoming of this massive territory. In their darkest hour, Latera hoped she could somehow preserve whatever faint light still existed in the hearts of her people. Just as she approached her destination, three Keegan men jumped out to surround her. They grabbed her, and one covered her mouth from behind before she could scream. As she desperately resisted and analyzed her surroundings, it seemed the lights in the homes around her had all gone out. The men dragged her into an alley off the road. She dug her heels in the mud and kicked out to fight as much as she could, but it was to no avail. After the past few weeks, she had known it would only be a matter of time before her distraction with everyone's safety but her own would be costly. Stop struggling and this shit will be over quicker, the attacker with his hand over her mouth grunted into her ear. His breath was eerily warm on her neck and was visible in the chilly rain. She shook her whole body, blind with a furious disgust. Trying desperately to voice her resentment, she could feel his hand only come down on her mouth tighter. Let's get this show on the road! Another man said hastily. We want our turn too, and this bitch is only staying quiet for so long. You calm your fucking tits. The first began to forcefully grab for Latera's clothes. Knowing she needed to act fast, Latera shook her head violently until she was able to bite down into the man's hand. When she did, he yelled out, and a struggle between them ensued. In the scuffle, Latera noticed the man's pistol in his open holster. You need help controlling a young girl? One of the others joked, which made the third laugh. Don't you dare take another step, 
The Keegan man wrestling with Tara yelped before they could approach. With the man's attention on subduing her, Latera noticed a window of opportunity. She lifted his pistol off him when it was out of sight of the others. When she succeeded, without him even having noticed it, she was thrilled, but as a figure wearing a hood appeared at the mouth of the alley, she abruptly stowed it away in her dress. The hood covered the figure's face entirely, but Latera could guess it a man by the height and breadth of his silhouette. A revolver with one of the longest barrels Latera had ever seen rested loosely in his hand. But that was the only thing she could make out from behind the droplets of rain before her attacker held her tight again. She breathed a sigh of relief that she'd managed to hide the revolver near her armpit, a place he couldn't feel it. It's raining cats and dogs out here, the man hollered merrily. Did you know the origin of that phrase isn't known for certain? What a crazy thing, huh? Look, sir, crazy indeed, the mysterious man interrupted. One theory is that since people had seen freak occurrences of it raining frogs or fish, raining cats and dogs would mean it was a particularly intense downpour. But if that were the case, don't you think the phrase should have included heavier, less tame animals? Like perhaps lions or grizzlies. So this person is familiar with the struggle between the Keegans known for their lion insignia, and the Vahani, known for their relationship with the grizzlies of the northern Marietta, Latera thought. The man who was holding her slowly began relinquishing her from his grip. She could feel his hands beginning to shake as she shoved him off her, and she wondered about the effect this person had on her attackers. We're going to be on our way now, the attacker called after giving Latera a look. Yeah, the hooded man acknowledged, you will be. Because if you don't leave, I'm going to be the one making the dogs rain down upon you. Hounds, to be exact. Maybe some wild cats, too. Then the phrase might have some real meaning for us after all, huh? With that, the men were off in an instant, but Latera's anger only exploded at their retreating backs. I will not forget your faces, Latera screamed at them. I will forget nothing. Each of those who has wronged the Vahani will pay, whether by my hand or not. They have and will continue to face my wrath. You three are on my list now, so run, hide, do what you must. But I will find you because I will not ever forget. Once Latera noticed they were out of sight, she turned back to the mouth of the alley only to find it was empty as well. All she could do was take a deep breath and fix her clothes as she darted back to the shelter. The whole way, she wondered what she would now do with this pistol she had stolen, and worried about the repercussions she'd face if it was discovered she'd taken it. Then, as she approached the shelter, Latera was terrified to see Elon waiting by the entrance under the cover of an overhang. Elon and she had not spoken since the capture of the Vahani of the Riverlands. Latera hated him and the Tokali almost as much as she hated the Keegans themselves perhaps even more. Especially now, with the condition they were in, her animosity was only growing by the day. Though she understood he did what he needed to do for his people, it did not change what he had done to hers. Elon, it really is not a good time. What are you doing here anyway? I do not know. She noted his clothes were drenched, and the bun in his hair was becoming unraveled. I have been waiting for you, but but now that you are here, I do not know what to say. Then say nothing and leave. I do not have time for your childishness anymore. I want nothing to do with you, just as you wanted nothing to do with me. Do you even know? I do know, okay? I know what I have done and I am sorry. And it is not that I wanted nothing to do with you. I wanted everything to do with you. I still do. Oh, are you f fucking kidding me? She exclaimed, using a word she'd heard the Keegans use regularly. She wasn't entirely sure what it meant, only that it was some kind of curse. Somehow it felt right to her to say it then, and he seemed as surprised by it as she was. The only thing you could do for me is to find me a way to end the misery my people and I face every single day in this place. Until you do so, there will remain nothing to say. Elon looked away as he thought for a moment. 
Do you want to come out of the rain and under this cover? It is pouring out there. I will not come near that entryway until you remove yourself from it. Elon rolled his eyes at her in frustration. A telling reply, she thought. Look, if your people just assimilate, we could truly have the unity we all want. I understand things are hard now, but they will improve with time, just as they have for us. As a matter of fact, Clovis is going to be addressing the hold for the first time since your people have come here. His men can be a hassle, but he may bring them into line for the sake of maintaining the order William Keegan desires. He seems to be set on keeping William out of his hair when possible. He is going to address the hold? When? Yes, this week. The gathering will be held in three days in the square, Elon answered. I was not supposed to tell you, so please do not tell anyone. But do you see now that I want to help? Matera well, said nothing at first, her mind racing a mile a minute. Uh, yes, of course. That helps a lot, Elon. I appreciate being informed, so thank you. You are welcome, Elon said, smiling wider than he should have been. Latero was only grateful for the news, but his desire to please her might prove useful. Let him think she could forgive him if it loosened his lips. I really think things will work out now that we are all together. It is my hope that pretty soon, the whole Marietta will be united. Her vision flashed red at his stupidity. Unity? This was slavery. Thank you again, Elon, but I must retire now. Of course, he said, moving away from the door. I will see you soon, I hope. Matera well, nodded at him but said nothing as she entered the shelter. Finally, she had it. She had what she needed to save her people. Winona was right. They needed to cut off the head of the snake if they were to gain their freedom. Now Latera had a weapon, a time and a place. In three days, she was going to kill Clovis Keegan. And that was part one of what tonight will be two parts, as we have been reunited with Latera and the Vahani at the hold. As we've seen, she's ready for action. So are we. So let's move to part two. Each and every night, Daniel Keegan ensured there was nothing to hinder the morning's light from seeping through his bedroom window and shining directly onto his face come dawn. It was his ritual, which he felt was the reason for any success he might experience. From a young age, he had promised himself he would work harder than anyone around him. This included the need to have as much time available in the day as there could be. This morning, however, he wanted the sun's rays to illuminate something in particular. Lying next to him, stark naked, was the goddess of a barmaid, Joanna Fontaine. Since awakening, he had experienced the joy of admiring her radiant blonde hair, lavish breasts, and extensive legs in the glowing light. After how far his brothers and he had come, it felt like he had earned such brilliance. Though he was not a materialistic or showy man, there were times when he simply needed to admire the things he was fortunate enough to have. Daniel lay straight on his back with her on her side, leaning against him with an arm and leg stretched over him. Her skin emitted a warmth against his. As the sun began to spread through the room, Daniel noticed a squint of displeasure twinge across Joanna's face. Her expression soured even more once her eyes had crept open. What the hell? What time is it? Why isn't the damn curtain down? She moaned as she turned off Daniel and faced the other direction, burying her face in the blanket beneath her. What better instruction could our world give us to rise than the dawn? Still in awe of the morning beauty and not complaining about the sight of Joanna from behind, Daniel stretched his limbs. What better instruction could my body be giving me to keep sleeping other than feeling tired? With her face buried in the sheets, she groaned aloud. 
Daniel stood up and began to dress, too ready to get down to business to mind or laziness. Our bodies can be deceitful about the things we need, he said. Are you this serious all the time? You didn't seem to have any problem with how serious I was being last night. Daniel joked as he came by her side of the bed and spanked her. Joanna jumped in surprise and perked up with a smile. No, I suppose I didn't. But maybe our relationship isn't meant to exist beyond the walls of the bedroom then. Who says it would have anyway? Daniel chuckled. Daniel Keegan! The nerve of you sometimes, I swear. I kid, I kid. I do need to be off now, though. Always work to be done. And there are some people I need to see. I'll swing by the saloon tonight, though. So how about you have some whiskeys ready? Whiskey? Joanna said with her face in a scrunch. Sick. I'll leave it to you to be drinking that shit. It sounds like a plan for later, hon. Daniel didn't actually have anything urgent planned for the morning, but he was ready to get out of his room. Sex with Joanna was great, and she was beautiful, but there were times when he found himself bothered by her. He had a hard time putting his finger on any one thing that caused it. There wasn't any way in particular she was wronging him, but something about their relationship wasn't right. In a way, he felt like a train moving at full speed, but rather than her being the steam that pushed him forward even faster, he feared she would only slow him down. As cold as it seemed to him, he couldn't shake the feeling. As he worked his way toward the lobby of the hotel, he noted how empty it was. In a place where there was usually a Keegan man or two to be seen, there was none. Only the old owner, Donald Schneider, sat mindlessly behind his desk at the front. He was a wrinkly fellow, whose whole face seemed to be drooping off his skull. While sitting behind the desk, his eyes always appeared closed, but when he perked up, there was a sweetness about him. His strange accent and little cylindrical hat he always wore were funny as well. One of the most well-known and liked people in Haran, Donald was one of the first people Daniel had met here, and Daniel was fond of him. Hey there, Don. How are you this morning? Daniel greeted him. Donald sat slumped back in his chair and let out a loud snore. Daniel figured it would be best to let him sleep and began to turn toward the door. Daniel, is that you trying to go sneaking off without so much as a how do you do? Donald asked, scaring Daniel half to death. Oh, I'm no sneak, sir. I was just trying to let you get some sleep. A good morning to you, Don. Daniel greeted him again. A dismissive, shaky old hand was waved Daniel's way. Well, heck, don't get your knickers in a bunch, Boyle. I was just giving you a hard time is all. It's right and proper to refer to your elders with Mr., by the way. Oh, I know, though I do hate being called Mr. Schneider. Donald interrupted. Makes me feel old, you see. And I don't need to be feeling any more of that than I already do. Please, stick with Don. All right, Don, will do, Daniel said as respectfully as he could. He was used to this routine with Donald, who repeated himself frequently. Daniel enjoyed their conversations, though, no matter how repetitive they were. In a way, he thought of them as a kind of challenge. He often would try to figure out how to approach them so Donald wouldn't need to repeat anything he said at all. Needless to say, Daniel hadn't gotten all that good at it to this point, but he was having a fun time trying. With so many interesting characters throughout the endearing town, Daniel felt fortunate at times to have landed in Haran. Did you know I'll be turning 75 in only seven months? Hell of a thing, ain't it? Three quarters of a century I'll have been alive, and the world only seems to have gotten more rife with turmoil as the years have gone by. Donald reveled in awe. Sometimes I think, you know, maybe I don't do enough to help stop it all. Maybe it's partly my fault that doesn't seem to have gotten any better in all that time. <laughs> I did know your age, sir, Daniel chuckled. You mentioned it last month, only difference being you said there were eight months left at the time. Sure is a hell of a thing, too. You're a special kind of man, you know. But we all have our roles to play. And yours is to bring people one of the most foundational necessities of life. Shelter. You can't be expected to save this world on your own. No one man could. Hmm. Donald responded with a pause. 
I suppose you're right about that one there. Kinda how I like to think of it too sometimes. Almost like you plucked that one right out of my head, you little thief. Daniel laughed with Donald, basking in the little victory of cutting a typically very long existential conversation down to a brief exchange. Great minds think alike. I can't lie to you though, there are times I've started to think the same thing too. Like, I look around at the people in this town. People like you, Donald. And think about how much respect I have for y'all. Y'all just seem to, to live a simpler way. A more neighborly way in general. I look at that, and I start to worry the same way you do. And even though I ain't got the years you got, the question I'm thinking about isn't as much if I've done enough to fight the storm, but if I myself am contributing to it. You're young, so of course you're contributing to it. Donald quipped, Daniel forcing an uneasy chuckle. Ah, thinking though. Seems to be just about the worst thing we could do at times. Keep everything in moderation though, I suppose. And maybe there'll be hope for you yet. I know it too well. But I bet you know same as me how hard it is to shut the mind off when you're a thinking man. So hey, you know why it's so quiet? Where's everybody at? Oh, I wouldn't know seeing as I'm usually the last to hear things around here. A bit odd that, considering I own a place where the comings and goings generally tend to happen. Sounded like some kind of nervousness outside amongst your men, though. Donald answered with a yawn. Your name seemed to have come up quite a bit, too. So it seemed it was something the H didn't want to be the one to tell you. Daniel scratched at his cheek with a sigh. I see. Another fire to put out as usual, I guess. I do hope I can feel like I made this world a better place when I get to your age, Don. With all the shit I've had to go through, hell, all I'm still bound to go through. But anyway, nice talk, and I'll be seeing you. It sure can all be fixed, and at some point, it will be. Donald's tone was stern now. Until then, though, Daniel. Daniel paused to consider this strange final note before gesturing goodbye and marching toward the door. He wondered if this was some sort of new wrinkle of hope that had somehow recently been inserted into Donald's repetitive mind. There was no point in dwelling on it, though, as by now everything Donald said felt like some kind of deja vu. When Daniel reached the door, there was one of his men quivering outside. Based on what Donald had said, Daniel presumed this man had drawn the shortest straw. Daniel, the fellow called out, there's something you need to see, sir. Anticipating this kind of remark, Daniel gave only a brief nod and followed the man to one of two horses waiting nearby. Once his man stormed off, he was quick to urge his horse on to follow. Their path led them toward a trail to the northeast away from the town. As they reached the outskirts, a spattering of blood could be seen along the road. It only seemed to get thicker the further they went, and soon enough, they came upon the burned-down Morel home. At this point, Daniel had inspected and was familiar with the scene of the house but he now saw a group of his gang members standing out in front of it where the trail of blood led to. When he rode up, they whipped around and stood at attention, moving fearfully out of his way. Once Daniel made it to them, he jumped off his horse and crept over to the subject of their attention. Before him sat a wooden sign, dug into the ground in front of a boulder. On top of the boulder was a dead man, pale as a ghost and draped in a wolf carcass, which looked almost alive as it was staring right at him. Daniel began to feel sick at the sight and the stench as he also noticed a lion's paw pin stuck in the place of one of the wolf's eyes. Needless to ask, but this man is definitely one of ours, yeah? Daniel turned to the group. They nodded in silent confirmation. Daniel looked back down at the sign. Written in blood, it read, And thus, my friends, your hunters shall become our prey. Daniel crept over to it. Though this message was facing their direction, away from the body, he noticed it was actually written on the back side of the sign. When he looked at the other side, he could see the front was painted a bright but fading yellow. Written on it in black, in friendly handwriting, were the words, Welcome to Haran. Well, that'll do it for the first episode of Season 2. Thanks, as always, for listening in. 
And as mentioned in the beginning, today was a big day. Along with this episode, today is the first day for the release of book four, Cryptic Kingdom, the penultimate book in the Civil Land series. It's available on Amazon in ebook and paperback, along with the first three books. You can get them all there. You can get them all in a bundle, I believe. I think on Amazon they sell them all in one bundle, so you can get them all at the same time for, I think, probably some kind of discounted price. So if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, if you don't want to wait week after week, just head right over there. It's a great way to support the podcast. I do not have a Patreon or subscribe star yet. I'm planning on probably setting one up soon, but in the meantime, like I said, paperback books are the way to go. Even if you don't want to read the paperback, if you just want to support you just want to have those books sitting around the house to enjoy the covers head on over to amazon and tell the world that you are a part of the civil gang be bold otherwise some side notes of interest in the time that i was gone the civil land series now has a map if you go to my homepage, www.nbaustinbooks.com you will find in the sub menus as well as in the, one of the featured blog posts towards the bottom of the page, the Civil Land series map. It includes all the cities and worlds and, and environments of the continent of Theresia where the Civil Land series takes place. It's a great thing to have by your side, to print, to have near you, so you can keep track of what's going on and where the characters are heading. It came out in extraordinary detail. I was very proud of it. Um, If anyone is interested in building maps of your own, the website Incarnate, that's Incarnate with a K, is really cool. It helps you put together um, those kind of fantasy-looking type maps. And I'm very happy with what, what came out of it. So go there. Go to Incarnate if you like building. Otherwise, check out the map on my website. Also, now that we're back into Season 2, this podcast will go back to being weekly. I look forward next week to recapping this episode. The recap episodes are going to get pretty interesting. Next week we're going to talk about Ryan Johnson, who is either the uh, the devil or possibly a hero. I'm going to get into that next week. But until then, this has been Chapter 1 of 11 of Book 2, Crystallize. As I've mentioned before, all chapters from all books are going to be released on this podcast at some point. Hope you're enjoying it so far. If you are, feel free to leave me some feedback either on social media or to my website in my contact form. Also, if you're reading the books, especially to those people who recently won the entire series giveaway, we had 10 people win the entire series in a giveaway as well as a map and bookmarks. For for anyone else, stay posted in the future because giveaways are one of my favorite things to do. But anyone who has read the books or who is enjoying the podcast and is subsequently going to read the books, and if you read those books and you have a great time, because it is a great time, no one is having a greater journey than the people in this series and those reading it. If you are part of that crew, if you are the Bold Alone, if you are the Civil Gang, head to Amazon and or Goodreads and feel free to leave a review. It would be much appreciated both for me hearing your feedback as well as for for growing this community, growing this gang, and keeping the fun going. Alongside buying the books, that's one of the best ways to support. So any any feedback of any kind posted anywhere, shared with your friends, is always greatly appreciated. Anyway, that's some of the open items for now. Look forward to talking to you again next week during the recap episode. Until then, I'm Nicholas Austin. This has been Tuesday Night Fiction. Talk to you again next week. The Tuesday Night Fiction podcast, the Civil Land series, and the musical score for the podcast are all produced.